This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, grace to you all and peace from God our Creator and from Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. I know I say, if I say I don't like rules, most everyone here won't be too surprised by that. Everybody knows me by now. But I don't. I don't. And actually, I don't think I'm all that different from most others. Kind of deep down on the inside of us, even if we follow all the rules that are normal, there's a part of us that says, whoa, I don't like that one. I don't. So I don't think I'm all that different. I think every one of us is there to a point. I think it's the real, real kind of test or the real uh, where maybe the rubber meets the road is whether or not we actually want to do anything about our dislike of it. I remember when I was a child um, from the library, uh, we, there was a book it was real popular amongst third graders. It was a book of basically crazy laws that is, existed in the United States in various cities. And I remember um, the book was called Donkeys Can't Sleep in Bathtubs. And it was because I think it was in somewhere in a city in New Jersey, it was against the law for donkeys to sleep in bathtubs. How it got there, I have no clue. Why it was never removed, I wasn't really sure. But boy, you better never let a donkey sleep in a bathtub, in wherever it was. And it had, the whole book was things like that. So I think it's in our nature. At least it was in the nature of every third grader that was a friend of mine to question those laws and those rules. It was. It's within us. And that's what we celebrate on this day, Reformation Sunday. Because not only is it a part of our inner being, but it's a part of our tradition. It is to not like those rules. I'll get there a little more later. Now, I think everybody knows my, my, my panache, my, how I function. I've got to get to my pocket here. And how I like to push the envelope. And I'm not going to start it yet, but I love to push the envelope. I think every time my bishop, John Anderson, sees my number on his cell phone that I'm calling, I think the guy gets a heart attack. Because I do things like this. Um, I think it was about a month ago, um, I woke up at about 2.30 a.m. and uh, I texted him um, something like, when's the last time you received a late night text? And then I asked, proceeded to ask him a bunch of questions. He never responded. So I like to do that. Maybe if there's a lesson to be learned, it's um, don't be my bishop. But 
I love to do this. So what I do at 7 p.m. last night, I text him a question. And I said, Bishop John, call my voicemail and tell me what it's like for pastors who break the rule. What's, what's it like for you for pastors who break the rules um, and push the boundaries? And here's some of the things he said. I have two different thoughts. On the one hand, there are pastors who push boundaries and get themselves into trouble uh, because uh, the boundaries exist to protect them from sin and from hurting other people. So the experience of caring for pastors who have broken sexual boundaries is heartrending. Caring for their congregations and the victims involved is even more heartrending. All of it just makes me sad. Um, so there are pastors who push boundaries and break them and are doing inappropriate things. That just causes me to get soul sick. So some rules are there for good reason. You know, um, what Bishop John was getting at, um, back in 2009, you know, when the ELCA got all up in arms about sexuality. It was a very anxious state of times. Not many people know this, but that year, Bishop John actually had to deal with, I think it was nine or 10 pastoral sexual misconducts. You know, you heard him say, what's it do? It makes my soul sick. Some rules are really good. Martin Luther said this a different way. He said something like this, well, of course you need rules and laws. You need the law, because if you didn't have the law, what would stop you all from killing each other? So some rules exist so others aren't hurt. And that's good and right. To use old Lutheran language, that's meet, right, and salutary. It's proper. It's good. Because we don't want to be hurt. But when we know that we need those rules to help govern us, we need directives from God going, hey, watch out. As humans, we get mixed up. And sometimes we make those rules into the gospel. And we lose our way. And that's, that's the story of the Reformation. That's what happened. We made the rules into much more than just a matter of protection. The rules became the gospel itself. You want to get to heaven, this is what you do. You want to go to hell, uh, get out of hell, um, you just got to pay the church this much money. So, rules are good, but we mess it up by clinging to them. We do. That's how we mess up. That's how we fall short. Thinking those rules will save us. Now, that was just a little doom and gloom from Bishop John. He went on, though, because he's, he's always nice. He gives both sides of it. I like that. He went on. On the other hand, we have pastors who are willing to challenge the construction of how church has been done. And um, when they work with their leaders and they build a shared mind and when they take risks and try something new uh, that serves the gospel, I think that's one of the sweetest things that uh, can happen. Sometimes pastors um, need to push through the way that it's always been. For instance, sometimes I think our congregations define themselves too much by their ethnic identity 
I'm proud to be a person of Norwegian descent, but most of the people who are uh, below 30 don't think in this category. So to begin to shape an identity for a church that isn't built around ethnic identity is crucial as we look at for the next 20 years. So there are pastors who push cultural boundaries in a number of ways, and they challenge us to think about how we're called to be church in the mission field that is and will be uh, when we are mostly thinking about the way it has been. Or sometimes we spend too much time thinking about who might get upset if we do something differently without thinking about the people who quietly leave when the church is not willing to take risks for the sake of the gospel. Think about his language. Sometimes we're too afraid to make people upset that we don't move forward, that we don't venture forward, that we keep doing things the way they've always been done. If that sounds familiar, that's also the story of the Reformation. Luther was probably maybe the, not the first, there are lots of folks in the history of the church but maybe one of the most notable who said, I'm not going to buy into that uh, this is the way we've always done it before. Now, if you, next time if you encounter Bishop John, I want you to, to shake his hand and go, that's pretty amazing um, to leave a voicemail at 9.30 p.m. on a Saturday night when you're challenged by uh, a pastor. So give him a round of applause. You can clap for him now, because I'll forward the sermon to him. So we get all wrapped up in what we think are rules to protect us, but they're not. Traditions, things that we think are necessary, that's how we mess up. And what's the only thing that is necessary? Christ. That's what's necessary. What does Jesus say in today's gospel lesson? The truth will make you free. It will make you free indeed. That's powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. That's the gospel. Knowing what limitations you have before you, how others will limit you and say no, and moving forward in spite of it. That's what Martin Luther did some 500 years ago. Many don't know the story that intimately or, or that well, but long story short is Luther faced excommunication and a death sentence for what he did. And he said, I don't care. This is how I'm doing it. This is how I'm moving forward. This is who I am. It's a powerful story. Knowing that we get messed up in those laws, those rules, and saying, no, those are the rules we need to rebel against. Why? Because who's the one that is important? It's that gospel, Christ. So where does that leave us? Sometimes I think as Christians of a Lutheran tradition, and Luther was very clear. He said, I don't want you, anyone to be called Lutheran. He wanted people to be called Christian. He was very clear about it. But what it means for us and our background and our tradition is I think we forget that Reformation story and what it means. We forget it. I think we have a tendency to go back 
to the church, oh, as it was maybe 1510, 1505, before 1517 when he posted those theses. We, want, we have a tendency to want to go back there because it's our human nature to live by rules, to get all caught up in them. And we forget our tradition of forging on through them and what it means to shed them and focus on Christ, to focus on Jesus, to fall back upon that faith. I want to share a story with you um, from my internship. Um, my internship supervisor and I was a year in Petersburg, West Virginia. Um, I, it, was a, it was a year of being um, trapped in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia with a supervisor who I didn't see eye to eye with, and this was not good because there was no way to run out of them trapped in the mountains. But we didn't see eye to eye. We get along very well now. Dearly love the man for everything he taught me, but we really did butt heads. And it was three weeks before I was leaving to go back to seminary in Chicago, completing my internship. I can't even remember the argument we had. Oh, I think, yeah, he made me preach his, my sermons to him before um, I preached them to the congregation. That's right. And I got all flustered and upset because I thought, I've taken preaching class. I can do this. I don't need to be watched over. And I got all mad. And so we're duking it out in the pews, in a couple of the front pews, and telling this how much it just made me mad. And he looked at me, and he starts crying. And he says two things. He said, first, do you understand why I had you preach the sermons to me first? And I said, well, it's because you wanted to make sure I preached okay. And he said, no, you don't get it. What about me? Don't you think I need to hear the gospel too? And still crying, he then says this. He looks at me and he says, don't you get it? Don't you understand your tradition? Don't you know where you come from? And he was referring exactly to this, this dynamic of not getting all caught up in those rules about what hoops you have to jump through. about those things, that that's not it. It's the gospel. It's that gospel that we get to rest back, fall back upon, calling us to charge forward in the world. Now these are church stories I gave you. How does that work out in the world? It's no different. I know if I called you to think back in your mind, or I'm not going to call you to turn to your neighbor because you won't tell them this one. All I have to do is ask the question of what's holding you back at some portion in your life, and everybody's got something. And usually it's another person who's holding, holding you back. What is it? And the gospel is that faith that you have that you can rest on to move forward to forward the cause of Christ, to move forward, and you'll be okay. That's the gospel. The challenge that we have before us to venture forward. Sometimes in this mess, we do have communion today. It's wonderful and perfectly appropriate to have communion on Reformation Sunday. And the reason, I think, is because we often lose sight of, of communion, we just think, oh, it's for all those bad things that we have. Yep, I got this sin, this whole sin checklist. Check that one off, check that one off, check that one off. Okay, they're all forgiven, good. That's living by those rules. That understanding we don't want. Instead, what would it be like if we understood communion, the body and the blood, the bread and wine, 
is courage stuff, courage food for moving forward. This is the Jesus that I need to move forward out there in the world. We get lost in those rules. And we have a God who sent us a son still with us today. In the form of the word, in the form of the scripture, in our baptisms, in the body and blood, so that we can move forward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.